You are listening to the Examine Life with Bram Levinson. Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. It's lovely to be back with you. Uh, I am once again, after a few years, in my closet. And the irony of being in my closet recording is not lost on me (laughs) for obvious reasons. Um, It's great to be back. It's been about a month and a half, something like that, since I've last recorded. I wanted to get an episode or two done and dusted as I head off to Greece for a couple of months. Very, very much looking forward to that. Um, I've got the trip in Greece that I'm giving. The September trip is sold out. There is still space in the October trip. So if you're looking for a wellness retreat that is, well, that will keep your feet on the ground and, you know, oversaturate your senses with everything that Greece has to offer, food and sea and sun and just the way the air feels and the sounds and the sights. I mean, if you want to, if you want to have a moment with me and with everybody else who's joining us, please feel free to join us October 10th to 20th. Uh, As well, you can look forward if you are in Toronto. I'm going to be in Toronto in November. And the exact date, if you bear with me, I should have had (laughs) this ready. But you know, I didn't, uh, is Sunday, November 19th at 4.30 p.m. I am going to be at Beaches Hot Yoga, and I am going to be doing a fundraising event. It's going to be a class. It is a roughly about an hour-long class, meditation, mindfulness, maybe a little bit of movement, a little bit of yoga. But this is going to be a free event uh, with a request to open your pockets, open your wallets, and donate money to an incredible organization that is Toronto-based that is called Feed It Forward. If you look up Feed It Forward on Google, you're going to find all the things that they do. I initially found out about Feed It Forward when I was in Toronto a couple of months ago, and I met with some students who had become friends, and they were telling me about this chef, this chef who apparently was training uh, unhoused population, unhoused people to cook, and paying them, and with the food they were making, they were going around Toronto uh, feeding the unhoused population. So that immediately piqued my interest as a great cause to see if I can use my time and energy to funnel resources towards. I have since found out that Feed It Forward and Chef Jagger Gordon have multiple initiatives. I think there are 13 initiatives. But just a couple of those include a pay-what-you-can grocery store. So the people who work there are volunteers, and it's a way to make food more accessible. And he is also, Chef Jagger Gordon, is also very uh, focused on eliminating food waste or reducing food waste as much as possible. And so there is a Feed It Forward app that... You, if you have food that's going to waste, you can just sort of ping yourself on the app with your location and people will come get the food from you. I just, I'm, I'm so in awe of what this guy does and what this organization does. And I don't know, it just felt intuitive for me to um, do whatever I could to help however I could. I've been spending more time in Toronto, so this just felt very natural. And luckily, I've met some incredible people who have helped me make this event happen. Again, it is at Beaches Hot Yoga on Queen Street East. This is going to be November, I forgot the date, Sunday, November 19th, 4.30 p.m. So if you are in Toronto, please join us for the event. Um, Bring your yoga mat. And if you cannot make it, 
please consider making a donation. You can either send it to me and you can contact me for that to happen or just do it directly through the Feed It Forward website. So I've got so much that I've been wanting to talk about over the past little while, but it's, you know, something really kind of major happened for me um, about a month, a month and a half ago. And I know that this is something that was on everybody's radar but let me just backtrack by going back to when I was about gosh I want to say about 15 when I was when I was young I had listen I had a rough childhood just in terms of being a gay kid in that time when the only examples I had of queerness or gayness around me or even in the media included characters who were ridiculed or characters who were beaten up and then, you know, went on to like talk shows to talk about their their otherness and their persecution. So growing up in my mind and in this body was not the easiest ever. And I will obviously go into more detail with that with my book, Storyteller which I believe I have finished one of the last drafts just side note for those of you who ever consider writing a book and maybe my experience is not everybody's experience but wow do I ever fucking hate this experience <laughs> I I hate writing books I love the initial sort of um, how can I call it the channeling the channeling of ideas and getting things down I love that the rest of it the editing the restructuring the going over and going over and going over wow what a pain there's nothing creative about it the only satisfying moment for me has been getting to the end of this draft, this last draft I've done, which basically I did because I was given direction by a really, really close friend of mine who is a writer. She read a previous draft and basically pointed out some some hard, loving truths that I needed to hear. Um, and based on her feedback, I started over from the beginning of the book. Even though everything was there, I needed to take stuff out. I needed to restructure. Anyway, I've done that. I believe that this is one of the last drafts. And one of the greatest things about this last draft is when I went through it after I had finished editing to read it, I read some chapters where I recognized, oh, this is perfect. The chapter is now perfect. It's taken years for the chapter to perfect itself and for me to help that happen. I kind of liken it to that story that I had heard that Michelangelo used to talk about his sculpting and he would say that you know when he was sculpting the sculpture was in the chunk of of stone that he was sculpting he just needed to reveal it he needed to chip away the superficial layers that were hiding it and that's kind of what this felt like when I read those chapters and and felt that recognition that's really what it was um wow was that ever satisfying so if you're ever thinking about writing a book and maybe this isn't everybody's experience but like I'm with you I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying understand that you're you're embarking on an experience that is going to test you in all the ways. And just side note, another side note, a side note from a side note. Uh, one of my book launches years ago, I remember I was so excited that the book was finally out. And listen, once you get the f the book out, that's half of the work. The rest of the time, once the book is out, then you got to do the footwork. You got to do the promo. You got to sell it. At the book launch, somebody came up to me and they're like, this is amazing. Congratulations. When's the next one coming out? And I thought, I swear to God, in my mind, I was just like, could you kindly please just go fuck yourself? With all love and appreciation present, you have no fucking idea what you're talking about. You have no idea how hard it took to get this book out. Don't talk to me about the next one. I don't want there to be a next one. And in all honesty, this book that I've just finished, I did not want to write another book when it downloaded as, oh God, I, I better write this. I remember just groaning. I was so um, not resistant because I obviously let it happen, but I was just so defeated by the fact that I was embarking on this experience once again. And I think that, well, not I think, I know that at the beginning of this book, there's some sort of dedication to the book itself for insisting on being born despite all of my best efforts. <laughs> so, so yeah, anyway. Um, my childhood was rough, and I remember picking up an issue of Rolling Stone magazine. I wanted, I think it was 1988, 1988, somewhere around there. 
and I, I was reading through it and I stumbled upon this feature on a new artist from Ireland and her head was shaved and just the way she looked and the way she expressed herself through the interview that I read about, I just thought, oh my God, this woman, there's something about this woman. And listen, as I wrote in my next book, I believe that suffering recognizes itself. So the part of me that was very real and what had no time for bullshit and really was attracted to other people who had suffered, you know, who knew what suffering was, that part of me was really attracted to this woman. And I remember going out to buy her, um, her CD. I bought her CD. And the second I heard her voice, I thought this is someone who is howling melodically her pain and her objection and her protest. And that resonated with me on every level. And I found one of my people in Sinead O'Connor. Since then, Sinead O'Connor has been one of my people. She, you know, knowing that she existed in the world, listening to the music that she has released ever since, watching her struggle with mental illness um, and being real about it, you know, being an, a, an observer who couldn't really do anything when her son committed suicide and, and knowing a fraction of her suffering that ensued. Um, it has been a painful privilege because this is somebody who did something for me all those years ago through her very existence. And that instigated a desire in me to do something for her. And obviously, you know, what could I do? Support her, you know. Anyway, flashback to, I don't know, about seven, eight weeks ago, I was in Toronto and I went onto Twitter or X or whatever it's called now with that maniac at the helm. Um, but I went onto Twitter and I saw that there was a new account that Sinead had opened and, you know, some people had basically questioned whether it was really her. And so she recorded a video. She recorded a video of herself. She, you know, saying I've, I'm, I'm in my flat in London and I'm, you know, this is what's going on. And, and it was just, it was so wonderful to see her and to hear her and to just to know that this person has been around for all this time and she really saved me. She really, really saved me as a kid. And so I commented on that, on that video, just saying it is so wonderful to see you. And there's so many of us who love you so much, something like that. Anyway, she liked the post. She liked it. She acknowledged it. And the 15 year old in me and the not 15 year old in me geeked out big because this was one of my idols one of my idols who you know back then when i was a kid these people were not attainable you couldn't reach them it just like send a letter to a record company or something the fact that she had liked it it just i don't know it just brought such joy real joy to me and then she posted something else and i commented on it and she liked that too and i i again geeked out as much as if it were the first time anyway Cut to, I want to say, just over a week later, some some period of time like that, I was back home and I was frying food. And accidentally, I burned my arm, my forearm, on the side of the frying pan. Now, where I burned my arm was exactly where I had had words from Sinead O'Connor's autobiography tattooed on both my forearms. So there's one sentence from her autobiography that really resonated or one that, that resonated enough for me to want to put it on my body. And those words are, music is for the things that cannot be discussed. And so I burn my arm. I notice that the burn is kind of on top of some of the writing, the, her quote. And at first I didn't think it was anything. I had never really burned myself cooking. So I just thought, oh, whatever, it's whatever. It's not an issue. It's not a thing. Cut to about 45 seconds later when it was really hurting. So I went to go put it under, I, I sort of ran the cold water and put it under the cold water, which I have since heard is not what you're supposed to do with the burn. <laughs> to go from one extreme temperature to another, not advisable. Anyway, long story short, I just was afraid that it was going to scar over her words because just having something, a reproduction of something associated to her on my body was, was everything to me. 
Next day, I found out that she had passed away. And I can't really explain what that moment was like, because when I when I look back on it, and even in the moment, I could observe myself. I could observe words coming out of me, and those words were when I because I saw somebody I know on social media posted it, and I just started sort of almost like not moaning, but just sort of a no, 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 no. That that came out of my mouth, and I observed it coming out of my mouth, and I I just allowed that expression to happen. It was very authentic. It was very pure. And I immediately was, you know, doing my own research online to see if it was true. And it was indeed true. And then I just started crying. Or rather, crying happened. I observed crying happen, happening. And it was intense. And it was visceral. And the pain was deep. And the pain was in equal parts for this woman whose suffering had been almost worsened by people, by humanity. She was treated like such shit in the States, especially by Americans. You know, she came out to speak truth about the Catholic Church and about the Pope and about her upbringing. She was raised in a home and this is all, obviously, I didn't know her. This is what I've learned through her autobiography and through just paying attention. But she was raised in a home with a mother who seemed to be mentally ill and who horribly, horribly abused her. And the picture of the Pope was up in her mother's room for her entire life. And when her mother passed away, she took that photo and she tore up that photo on international, or rather on American television, but it became an international event to protest her upbringing, to protest abuse, to protest what had been done to her, to protest the hypocrisy of the Catholic Church, to protest. And she is and always will be a protest singer. This is what her intention was. She would, she didn't want to make it big internationally. She wanted to be a protest singer. And the irony that so many people have paid homage to her by performing Nothing Compares to You when, yes, it was the song that made her an international star, but she didn't want that, number one. And number two, it was written by Prince, who, if you read her autobiography, uh, tried to assault her, really terrorized her. Um, so the irony of people, they keep on playing that fucking song, and the irony of that is not lost on me. I almost feel like I'm speaking for her, and I, I hope that's not presumptuous. But anyway, long story short... I cried for her suffering. I cried for how the world treated her. I cried for my 15-year-old self who was very present in that moment and was hurt by the loss of this woman, this person, this being, this energy. And listen, I do believe in life after death because I believe that we'll never live in a world without Sinead O'Connor. I won't. You won't, as long as you know about her. You will never live in a world without her. But nonetheless, it was it was hard. It was hard for me. Anyway, listen, I recovered after about an hour uh, and then texted with a friend of mine. And we were sort of, she checked in with me because I had posted something on social media about this. And I told her about the burn. And in that moment, I was starting to recognize the burn as something other than a literal burn. And my friend texted me immediately after I told her about the burn from the day before. And she said to me, listen, if this was her way of, if this was Sinead's way of saying something to you, of communicating something to you, what do you think she's communicating? And in that moment, without, without even flinching, without blinking, I just replied that there is a degree of connection that we are so oblivious to, but that exists all around us and at all times. Came to me very clearly. In hindsight, I believe that, and I and and I believe that Sinead passed away sometime around the time of the burn. I do believe that this was some sort of connection. I believe that even if it wasn't her communicating with me, it, there was some sort of connection. There was something there, and this epiphany, this understanding, this reminder, 
that there is a level of connection that we are completely unaware of through this entire journey of life. I believe, I do believe, that we are aware of it before we are born into these bodies, and we are reminded of it as we approach the death of these bodies. I believe that we know about this connection. I kind of believe that on some level we are aware of it throughout these lives that we lead in these bodies. But what I also know is that navigating the world in a human body is navigating an entire existence of division and suffering and obstacles and jump through this hoop and struggling to keep your head above water. I understand that the world is not set up for us to thrive. The world is set up for us to contribute to an economic system. We are trained to learn so that we can learn something well enough that we can make money at it so we can pay our taxes and buy shit and keep paying for all the shit that we accumulate. I get that. And by the way, I'm not demonizing money. I think money's fantastic as long as you recognize what it is and how to use it responsibly. But with that said, we're not trained to take care of each other. We, as I've said this a million times, you've heard me say this a million times, we are not trained to take care of each other. We're trained to do everything else. We're not trained to take care of ourselves. We are not trained to recognize that the experience of life is about suffering. We are not trained as to how to contextualize that suffering and what to do with it and how to transcend it. And listen, because we're not taught that, I have a career and I have a mission in my life because I, the word career is reductive as far as I'm concerned. This isn't my job. This is how I choose to spend my life, reducing suffering, helping people contextualize their suffering. You know, because listen, suffering recognizes itself. And I found Sinead, and then maybe through this burn, Sinead reminded me that she was there all along. Who knows? But I do believe that there is this almost indescribable degree of connection connection. If you look up quantum entanglement, quantum entanglement kind of talks about what I'm talking about here. The things can be connected even if they are divided by distance and time and space in ways in which the human brain would think there can't be connection given that distance. I believe there is connection. I believe that there is a level of connection to which we are completely oblivious. And if we reminded ourselves, which I have been doing since this whole situation with Sinead, I believe that life had a lesson for me to learn, which is that there is really no separation unless we buy into the separation that is thrust upon us by governments and corporations and by other people. And you know what? Fuck them all. This is me standing up in my own life, recognizing every single moment where I get pulled into, into division Every moment where I get pulled into objection and intolerance and everything that contributes to what I object to in the world today, because it, of course this shit is going to land with me. So ever since this whole situation, every time I notice that I'm getting pulled into these energies, I remind myself there is a level of connection to which we are oblivious, but which is the undercurrent of all things. And in those moments, that is my mindfulness practice to bring me back to good and to bring me back to clear and to bring me back to a place where all of a sudden I feel my body relax. I feel the tension drain away. I can redirect my attention towards something that is more joyous and more helpful. And all of a sudden, Sinead O'Connor once again is my teacher. I'm talking about this because I want you to consider what I'm talking about. I want you to consider that there is a level of connection that you are completely oblivious to, that if you actually had been, if we had been taught about this level of connection from childhood, we would not be in the situation we are today globally with division and racism and misogyny and othering and the suffering that we impose on each other and on ourselves. I believe that if this was something that we reminded ourselves of more of on the daily, it would help alleviate a lot of the struggles and suffering that we encounter on the daily. I want this now to be yours. I do believe that things happen in my own narrative for me to share them, because ultimately this narrative is a shared narrative. And I understand that there are, I understand we are not the same. Okay, I understand if we're looking at the experience of life, we are not the same. I was born into a male white body that immediately affords me privilege and privileges that I have not earned. I get that. I also understand 
that we are all energy animated or animating a human body. And I choose to look at that. I choose to look at that connection because that helps me connect to people whose, you know, life accidents, accidents of birth are different from mine. And typically those would be the things that would separate people because if you don't recognize yourself in someone else, then how are you supposed to connect to them? Because there's fear and because there's ignorance and blah, 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 blah. I'm not having it. I, I refuse to play that game anymore. I will not play the game of division. There is a degree of connection that we are completely oblivious to. And because we are oblivious to, there are billions of dollars made, made off of our behavior. I refuse to participate in that behavior anymore. So this teaching that there is a level and a degree of connection that binds all of this and all of us together on levels that we are completely oblivious to. I want you to consider this. I want you to keep reminding yourself of this. I want you to see what, if anything, is the result of this mindfulness practice for you, by you. And I want you to reach out to me once you've applied this a little bit and please let me know how this is landing with you. Not because necessarily I want, to cr I want to create social media engagement or try to big up the podcast. If you know me and you know this podcast, you know that I've, it's not that I don't care about it. It's that I don't want to play the game that everybody else is playing because at this point, everybody and their fucking third cousin has a podcast. You know, I know that I sort of was, was on the ascent with podcasts, more or less. I was towards the end of it. I was actually quite late with it. And so... You know, this whole thing with everybody's got a fucking podcast and everybody's speaking into the void and everybody just wants to hear the sound of their own voice. I don't want to be a part of that. I, if I'm going to record an episode, I want you to know that I'm recording it because I believe there is worth and value there, not because it's just one more voice speaking into the cacophony, cacophony rather, of voices. Um, but I want this to matter. My role in the world is to help. In a world where there is just, or at least it just seems, there's othering and suffering and all of, you know, all of the things, I want to do something different. And the reason why I'm asking you to get back to me and let me know about whether this makes a difference for you is actually so that I can keep Sinead alive and well. I want to keep Sinead's energy. I want to keep her teachings. I want to keep what she means to me and to millions and millions and millions of other people out there in the world. I want to keep all of that alive. And if you can take this teaching of there is connection on a level to which we are completely oblivious, but if we remembered it more often, we would wake up and stop playing the game of division and contributing to these energies that we object to, then that's keeping Sinead alive. And she is right? She is because we are, and I am because she is, and was, and always will be. And that's what it's about. I hope that all made sense. I know I can babble. <sighs> Listen, think about all of that. Let me know what you think, please. Uh, and just before I go, this trip in October in uh, Greece, on the island of Paros, if you would like to join us, visit my website, bramlevinson.com. Check the, I think it's the retreats tab. Check it out. But feel free to reach out if you want details, if you want information. Um, it's the first time I'm doing a second group just because there was demand. And um, the group is small right now. And to be honest, I don't, I'm not attached to it being a big group. Uh, I believe that people show up to the events that they need to be at. And I don't really look at attendance. I look at the souls, the energies that have shown up and understand there's going to be an amazing uh, experience of connection and inspiration, whoever shows up. And so if you're interested, listen, check out my website or reach out or do both. Um, and yeah, there's a degree of connection to which we are completely unaware, completely oblivious to. And if we were more aware of it, it would change everything. And the evidence is, for me, over the past four or five weeks, it has changed everything. Anyway, give it a good think. I will see you later. Take care, everybody. This has been The Examine Life with Bram Levinson.